Welcome back, everyone, to another new episode of Grow Your Path to Wellness. Uh, if you missed last week, uh, well, we had a reschedule from last week. So our most recent episode that released was Lauren Ammon, and we talked about reaching peak performance through your mind. So not just for athletes, but just she kind of honed in on her expertise and talking about how to kind of move through mental blocks and and perform to the best of your ability and working with your own brain to achieve that. So this week we have Casey Frederick. She is a professional artist, an army veteran, a spouse, and a mother of two. Before we started recording, she shared she has a two-month-old right now. So we're so excited that she's giving us some of her Sunday morning. She has a passion for houseplants, making art, helping others, and of course, being a mom. Welcome, Casey. We're excited to talk all about art therapy today. Thank you for, like I said, being with us this Sunday morning. Thanks for having me. All right, Casey. Casey is another TikTok find, right? Mental health TikTok is roaring with really fantastic uh, therapists uh, and and doctors. And um, I'm so glad to have met you. And especially the fact that you're an art therapist. It's so needed and um, such a small profession still. We have an art therapist, Jenna. She's had a couple episodes on here as well um, in our nonprofit we have, uh, where she offers a lot of services. And she just did a continuing education on art therapy for um, some social workers to give them insight into that. So I'm just so glad to have you here, Casey, to share more about this wonderfully beneficial skill. Um, so what got you into art therapy? And then it, maybe in that, if you could describe like, what is art therapy? Sure. So gosh, this started back in high school, actually, when I was selling to museums, I was making my own artwork and selling. Um, I had sold three pieces to Ripley's, believe it or not, museums around the world. Um, and it wasn't as fulfilling as I expected it to be. I really, you know, decided it's not about the money. Like this is something that really helps me emotionally and mentally. And I want to provide that to other people. So how do I do it? And my initial thought was I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be an art teacher and I'll help people that way. Um, and then when I got to college and started taking art education classes, I took a psychology class and was like, no, I'm going to switch. So I did a dual major in psychology and art and then ended up getting my master's degree in art therapy, which is required to practice as an art therapist. Um, so that's kind of my journey and how it came about is just realizing how beneficial it was for me and for other people and um, trying to shift my goal into utilizing it in that way rather than for, you know, substantial profit from selling artwork. Um, but art therapy in the gist of it is basically a health and human services profession. Um, it is integrating creative processes with your no more typical psychological and therapeutic approaches. Um, and that can look a whole lot of different ways. So we're integrating theory with painting, drawing, clay, basically anything you can think of making with. I've used cups of water and food coloring and dish soap. Um, blowing bubbles and making art with artwork with that with children, which is probably what most people think of when they think of art therapy. Um, but I've also done like kintsugi, where you break a bowl and you smash it and you glue it back together and you, you know, highlight it with gold luster and talk about cracks and putting our pieces back together, which is more of course, like an older adult type of approach to treatment, but it's really beneficial and it can help, you know, both individuals, couples, families, communities, um, in a lot of different ways. Oh, so good. I've seen, yeah, actually Jenna's done some of those things. So it's just, it's so cool. And I appreciate you. I'm so excited to get into more of this because like, Kelsey will probably agree with me like social work you know you say hi I'm a social worker and they're like oh you take kids away and like that's all you think right like <laughs> right um so I'm just so glad that you have this opportunity to kind of debunk some things and and share the the knowledge yeah absolutely do you mind this is like just blatant curiosity but like for you was art like were you always drawn to art like that doesn't have to be the case for people to engage with it like that well, we'll get into misconceptions and stuff later but um, but when I heard you say it's been so beneficial to you, you don't have to share anything you're com not comfortable sharing, but what does that mean for you? Cause I think some people with art therapy, they're like, yeah, it could be beneficial. 
um I enjoy it but like it's it's so much more and I don't if you're yes. if you're comfortable sharing like what was that for you when you like made that connection absolutely so it's really about externalization and kind of reaching a point of catharsis um so for me when I'm making artwork I get into a state of flow which most people know what that feels like where you're, you know, creating or you're doing something you enjoy and are passionate about and you lose track of time. You forget where you are. And all of a sudden you're like, oh gosh, what time is it <laughs> when you finish what you're doing or kind of snap out of it? Um, and that's something that it gives me. So I can really kind of zone out from the world and just purely be in a creative mindset. Um, but additionally to that, it's about putting your feelings and even like bodily sensations into the process. So if I'm doing something more emotional and I need more containment, it's probably going to be like pencils, pens, markers, something that's not so messy because I don't want to, you know, overflow, which is also a technique that we use in our practice as art therapists um, for containing those feelings and not allowing flooding to occur. Um, and then there's other times where I really need to make a mess because it's in my body and I just need to use my body to like throw paint around or whatever. Um, but I also do a lot of weaving and that's kind of like telling a story and it's very meditative and repetitive movements. So I feel like depending on what my needs are is what medium I choose. Thank you. Because like, I, I feel like all three of us, you know, I'm not, I'm not trained in that. I don't specialize in it, but I know about it because of the incredible people that I've got to connect with and learn from. And I do think when people think about it, it's, they don't, or gen, the general person out there who listens to this may not realize like, oh, you go to a certain, you go to a certain type of art, depending on, and I love the language that you use, Amanda, and I use that all the time. Like it's in my body. I feel the urge to do a certain type of mm -hmm. thing and create a certain type of thing. It's less about the end product, but more of like what I'm intuitively feeling that I need to move through. So. And right. I feel like that's a really important piece to art therapy too, is that it's about the process more so than the product. So it's more about the meaning that you're making through the process of creating. And then of course the product is a wonderful after piece that we still consider and it's very important in and of itself as well but it's really about connecting the end product to the process um, and not just focusing on the image that's created absolutely thank you for that um can, can we get into like who who can art the, like therapy help and and how does that help them so maybe a helpful kind of bridging off of um, yeah most recent question yeah. So interestingly, I've had experience working with a wide range of people. I would say that I've worked with as young as four to five years old, all the way up to 70. Um, so it can be really beneficial for a wide age range, lots of different types of populations. So not only am I working with children and adults, but I'm also working with first responders, military, um, really anybody and everyone can benefit from art therapy. Now, I would say that there are instances where materials or maybe art therapy is triggering or something like that. Um, so it may not be beneficial to everybody and that's okay because if we were the best fit for everybody, then that would be a problem, right? So um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of different ways it can benefit. Like for children, it's much more bodily emotion focused, um, more kinesthetic approaches to mess making and self-regulation and those types of themes. And then when you get into more teenage years, I would say I focus a lot on identity processing through art making and like self-esteem and body image and things like that, which also ride into my adult population a little bit as well, that self-esteem and body image. Um, but we're also kind of processing major life stressors, major life transitions, um, doing life timelines, doing trauma narratives. Um, it gets a little bit more cognitive and a lot more in depth when you work with adults. I know that um, that kind of brings up for me like uh, the inner child work that mm -hmm. Kelsey and I also do. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I... <laughs> 
I'm trying to allow myself to be creative. So I'll, I'll have our art therapist, you know, she does a lot of good creative accessible things for the community that aren't necessarily art therapy, but like creative expression. And um, yeah. I just remember I went to a Zen Tangle, her Zen Tangle workshop and I'm like, yeah, this is cool. I'm going to be drawing. And every single time I started to do one, I was just like, like all tense and mm -hmm. um, like shortness, not shortness of breath, but like, um, what's the word I'm trying to use? Like just short breaths, like not like holding your breath. Like, yeah, I was just in such an, like a tense state and I had to like tell myself, okay, like, it's just a line. It's just, mm -hmm. a circle. It's just a box. Right. Um, so I, I say all that to say, I think it's so helpful for the process of like tapping back into that creativity and curiosity and just flow, like you said, and just letting it happen and being okay with mistakes, which um, you know, I think often our therapists will say that it's like the art, if you make a great piece, that's cool, <laughs> but it's the process, um, yeah. that I'm sure you can probably speak to as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's a wide range of feelings that can come up when you're making art, which I think is why it's so important to have a trained art therapist there if that's going to be part of the process. Like if you're coming to therapy and you're like, I want to use art as my way of doing this whole thing, you want an art therapist because we're specifically trained in how to contain, how to explore, how to manage all of those feelings that art and imagery and symbolism and, um, you know, that tactile stuff can really bring up. Um, and like you said, with the Zen tangle, it's supposed to be meditative. It's supposed to be so calming, but it brings up that perfectionism. Like, no, I can't erase it. I can't do any of these things. And it can be really frustrating. Can you speak? I know we don't have a lot of time, but just in a, in a general kind of sense, like what you mean by containing those emotions or like, I heard you kind of use that language, like flooding we know what that means, but when somebody's right. like, that might be a good fit for me, why is it important to consider that? Yeah, so one containment can look a lot of different ways, but containment is really important so that you're, the way I like to say it is kind of like a dance. You're dipping into the discomfort and coming out of the discomfort, dipping into the discomfort and coming out of the discomfort in a way that feels safe to the client. And it's kind of on the therapist and the client relationship to understand that dance. And I think that's why rapport building in the beginning is like first step, because once you have that relationship, you can have that understanding of what is your boundary, what's comfortable and uncomfortable look like for you. Are there body signals that are coming up during the process? Like, are you beginning to shake? Are you beginning to, you know, well up or start to cry? And that's when we might lean back and take a pause and kind of come out of the discomfort. And that would be kind of what containment looks like in that way. Um, but containment can also look like a mandala where you're working within a circle and that circle is your boundary and it's meant to contain your thoughts, feelings, memories, whatever's coming up as well. So it can be both in the therapeutic relationship and also within the art making. Oh, that's so like multifaceted. Oh, I love it. And this is why I, yes, I will just emphasize what you said. It is very important if you're looking to do those sort of things as a part of processing therapy or if you're a therapist that's like oh that sounds like something that would benefit my clients that's something that you should definitely refer out for yes. um so let's talk about I know one of your passionate populations is military and first responders um yeah. what does art therapy do um or what the maybe successes have you seen there or anything else you specifically want to touch on about art therapy with that population yeah, so I've had a wide array of experiences. So I've worked in um, as an intern with transitioning service members through an open studio approach. I've worked with um, service member adolescents through partial hospitalization, and I'm now working with um, first responders and some mostly retired military at this point who are just kind of working in the government. Um, so vast array of working with people, and I think each of these scenarios can be beneficial with art therapy. The open studio kind of allows for more of the camaraderie where they can come in together, share stories, talk about their frustrations with the med board or the transition process in general is so frustrating um, for them. So they can kind of come in and not have to censor themselves and make art together and just engage in that community building aspect of it. Um, where in individual sessions, when I'm working with them, it's much more processing, you know, daily life frustrations, workplace traumas. Um, and in those situations, we 
do a little bit more controlled work with like pencil markers, those types of things, or I'll, I have a virtual sand tray because I'm working virtual right now. So I use the virtual sand tray also for them to kind of share stories um, in a flexible way. But it's been really incredible watching them. One of my favorite art therapy directives that I do with my service members is um, capturing their military identity through designing a tattoo. So that is a way that they really enjoy because they're like, oh, this might be my next tattoo, you know, kind of thing. They get really excited about it. So Amanda, we both love that, that idea. That. And I was like, that's <laughs> genius. That's the most genius thing that I've ever heard. I love that so much. <laughs> I think my jaw like visually dropped. I'm like, I'm gonna oh. I'm gonna be like, no, I can't because she's not an art therapist, but <laughs> you can have them think about it or like write down some ideas. Oh, I was gonna bring it to my therapist and be like, hi, yeah. I want to do this. Yeah. She's a psychologist. She's not an art therapist, but I'll tap, oh, okay. I'll tap into Jenna and be like, Hey, give me some guidance. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I have a question because you talked about rapport. We know that there can be, um, I don't like to call it resistance, but just, we need time, right? We need time to build trust in general with people. And so, um, I would think maybe this isn't true, but I would just think that the military and first responder population, just because of the training and the type of standard and structure and th yes. routines that they go through, that that might be a little different to navigate. And there might be more of that. I don't want to call it resistance. I just, it might take more time with them. Um, so this is kind of like a multifaceted question, but like, what do you notice about that? That's different from maybe like a different population or others. Um, as far as rapport building and at what point and it's probably individualized you start are they coming to you specifically for art therapy like do you have to convert them to understand and want to do art therapy <laughs> how, how early on do you in, uh, introduce it I have so many questions <laughs> yeah no so that is an amazing question and something super important about the military and first responder population it's it is like weeks of trust building weeks and weeks of trust building because they are in flux all the time. They are in survival mode all the time. They don't have consistent sleep schedules. They're, you know, basically their fight or flight response is on all the time. Um, so when they're in session, it's really about making that connection with them and helping them find safety in the space, even if it's virtual, which is primarily what I've been doing. Um, and interestingly enough, after a while, a lot of them are like, when I went on maternity leave, they were like, we don't want to meet with somebody else. We're just going to wait for you to come back because they were able to build enough substantial rapport, which is hard for them, that they didn't want to try to start over with somebody else temporarily. So that kind of alludes to how delicate that relationship is. Um, and I always start when I meet a new client that's a first responder or service member, I say, I am a trained art therapist. Disclaimer, that does not mean you have to make artwork, right? And then as we build that relationship, I say, hmm, you know, we're kind of stuck. We're not, we need to think about a new way to get insight. How do you feel about doing this? And I'll suggest an art directive or just purely exploration or scribbling on a piece of paper is a really easy way to start. Um, and they're much more apt to try it once the trust is built. And so it's clear you integrate it with, you know, with other methods. Like, I think a lot of us, we would consider yes. ourselves like, you know, very integrative and we, not every client's the same. So I hear you mm -hmm. saying like, it's a whole process, you know, some, with some, you might jump in right away and do like these art interventions, like specifically right. with others, it's like, we we get there but their process looks different or maybe you don't do a whole lot of it with some clients you just here and there as it feels appropriate right and it looks a lot of different ways too like I said the sand tray kintsugi drawing painting I've had people um discuss like video games or want to show me like Minecraft creations things like that so it really bridges all of the creative aspects which I think makes it feel a little less scary when there's more options than just painting and drawing. And I think for, for myself, I kept, I keep, I catch myself have just putting a lot of expectations on it and things. And I like how you're like, you kind of just enter the space with them and say like, that's not what this is about. And right. 
if we end up doing some art cool but like there's that's not what the only thing that that we're going to be doing here so absolutely kind of puts, it's very client centered more client centered than what I think people would realize or assume Right. And that's very much my approach is client centered. I know some therapists, you know, take different approaches and work from more of, you know, other classical theories, but I tend to kind of take a broad approach to my clients because I want them to feel like it's really geared toward them uniquely because each person is so different. Absolutely. And I think that gives us a good jumping off point to our kind of our last one that I, that I, I added for you because I was, I'm very excited about today's topic and, um, but ways that it, that art therapy can be accessible and maybe we can break through some of just the larger misconceptions that people might have about it. Yeah, so accessibility to art therapy can be difficult because I think there are, in some cases, added fees for that portion. Um, so it depends on like insurance and the practice and there's a lot of technicalities that come into play, but I believe that it should you know, it shouldn't be this thing that is unattainable, that if somebody could truly benefit from it, then we should be bending to help them get access to it. So there's a large part of art therapy for me that is also advocacy, which is also part of this experience is like just getting it out there and helping people understand um, what it is and how it works and that it's not so scary. Um, but yeah, so advocacy, I think, is a big part of making it accessible right now because there are a lot of roadblocks for some people still. Um, but in general, for the misconceptions, I think something we talked about a little bit was like working with kids versus working with teens and adults. And I think the misconception, major misconception is this is just for kids. They just come in and do a coloring page and, you know, color their feelings or scribble their feelings. And it's so much more than that. Um, it really is like the dynamics of the therapeutic relationship. There's so um, important goals that are underneath everything that we choose to do, every material, every art directive, every conversation we have, there's intention. Um, and it bridges every age group. So all of those things come into play for every age group. And we might just tailor what we choose to the age that we're working with. This has been so helpful. And, you know, there's obviously so many other things that my brain has been so many. <laughs> activated in my brain since we've been talking that I've been like, no, just reel it in, Amanda. We don't have time for all these questions, but seriously, I could <laughs> sit with you for so long and just learn more. And um, yeah, just get, getting that message out to the community is so helpful. So um, with that being said, is there any like parting words or any, like, is there, uh, sometimes this is like a favorite mantra or just wrapping up, like, or anything that our audience should know um, as we're closing out today? Yeah, I mean, one major thing I would say is if you're curious in, about art therapy, check out the arttherapy.org. Um, that's the American Art Therapy Association website where you can find an art therapist by using the map that's on there. You can learn more about what it is. You can learn about how to become an art therapist. Um, so it's a really incredible website with all the information you need about what we do and how to find us. Um, and just parting words, I would say, engage with that child part because even as an adult art can be a little scary because a lot of people haven't made art since they were in elementary school or um, haven't made art since high school whatever it is it's not about if you're good at it or not just really tap into that creative part of you allow yourself to make mess and it can be really freeing go play <laughs> yes go play that's a good way to put it I love it I'm all about it and uh, I think um, you'll probably agree, Casey, that like when you have children or even dogs that are active and, you know, hyper and playful, like it just brings that um, tapping into your own inner child and play and curiosity and just carefreeness and curiosity about the world around you so much, so much better. Uh, so good. Where can people find you um, if they're interested in learning more or just following you on social, that type of thing? Yeah, so since having my kiddo, I haven't been as active on TikTok as I'd like to be, but I do have my TikTok account where you can find me there as Casey Frederick. And then on Instagram, we are at High Strung Art Studio, um, which is my professional art page. And then if you are curious about art therapy or looking for a practice that specializes in first responders or military, you can also find my bio on 
Psychology Today or at firstlinecounseling.com. Awesome. Thank you, Casey. I truly appreciate your time, especially with um, little ones at home. Um, we are so excited and uh, the audience, I'm sure will want you back. So you're welcome back. Um, this, you know, Thank continue you. this topic or another one you're passionate you. about or dig into something further. We appreciate it. Yes. Uh, all right, everyone, uh, make sure you subscribe, turn on the notifications so that way you know when we post a new episode. Um, next week, we are bringing Ricardo Wilkin, Wilkins, excuse me. Um, he's going to be talking about life's biohack, the toxic environment threatening human health and extraordinary, extraordinary way the body communicated healing on a cellular level. That was a lot of words. <laughs> Um, so we're excited to dig into that more and have him uh, share that with our audience. We will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.